Uh, thank you all for joining us today for our second week in our Archives in Crisis series. Uh, the eight-week workshop series is an in-depth course on how to respond to rapid onset and slow onset disasters or crises. Uh, we're really pleased that a lot of you are joining us for the second week in a row uh, and look forward to seeing others of you in the future as we progress through the series. Um, the series itself is funded by a grant from the Louisiana Board of Regents Support Fund, the Gilbert Center for Public History, the Gilbo Charitable Trust, and the Department of History at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. It's part of new initiatives from the Gilbo Center for Public History, uh, as well as larger statewide initiatives by the Louisiana Historical Association, the Louisiana Archives and Manuscript um, Association, and others within the state uh, to deal with this crisis that our archives are facing uh, throughout our state. Uh, we want to give thanks today, particularly to the Light Center for hosting us uh, in this wonderful environment, which really lends itself to all sorts of activities throughout the eight weeks that we're here, uh, and to AOC Media, who is in the back and filming us. Uh, for those that were here last week, you know that um, we are filming this series. It will be up on YouTube a little bit later on. Uh, so we anticipate week one going up sometime in the next couple of days, uh, and we'll let you know when it's up so that you can share it with others others who are not able to attend. And if there are any weeks that you are unable to attend, you can look for the week uh, on YouTube a little bit later on uh, during the course of the semester. Um, as you may know, um, I am Dr. Liz Skilton. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of History at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And I'm also the co-director of the Center for um, or the Gilbo Center for Public History um, with Dr. Ian Beamish, who's sitting right here, and Dr. Marissa Petru, who's sitting over here. Uh, and I'll introduce them a little bit more in the future. Uh, I do want to note uh, that our next week in this series actually takes place in two weeks. Uh, and that's going to be um, Karen Pavelka, who's coming from UT Austin, uh, to talk about paper recovery. Uh, she'll be leading uh, a basic lecture and then two hands-on workshop series to talk about how to recover documents that have been drowned uh, or to deal with other sorts of issues related to water uh, or paper recovery after crises. Uh, Pavelka has worked in Puerto Rico, Haiti, and Texas most recently after uh, crises helping institutions and we're very excited to host her. Um, and a couple other housekeeping related items before I turn this over for our introduction of our wonderful speaker uh, today, Nakai Northup, uh, is that um, the first has to do with why we're taking a break from the workshop series next week. And that's because the department is hosting uh, a conference called Representing Enslavement. Uh, we've got speakers coming in from all over the country. Uh, and Dr. Beamish here is the uh, person responsible for coordinating it. It also coincides with our Gilbo lecture uh, for the year, uh, which is Dr. Lakeisha Simmons. Is that right? Yes. Uh, who's going to be talking? I'm going to blur this completely, um, but on uh, memories of uh, enslavement, particularly related to Beyonce and Lemonade. Uh, so that'll be a fantastic lecture. You can look up more information about it if you just type in Representing Enslavement Conference to Google, and it should pop right up. Uh, so we hope that you'll join us for that. Uh, another housekeeping related uh, announcement uh, is that the Light Center uh, Wi-Fi is available for your use. Uh, so the um, overall Wi-Fi is called Light Public Wireless and the password is lights like a light. So lights, plural, at, at light, L-I-T-E. Uh, so you should be able to sign on um, and access the Wi-Fi during today's event. If you are online and you are active on social media, we ask that you tweet about the Archives in Crisis series. You can use the hashtag uh, Archives in Crisis, uh, and that'll help us link uh, information that's available. You can also follow the department on Twitter at ULP. 
Public History uh, and on Facebook at UL History Department. Uh, so you should be able to find us in all of those locations. Uh, I also want to draw attention to the Louisiana Historical Association Save Our Archives initiative, uh, which this workshop series uh, is building uh, on. Uh, the Save Our Archives initiative uh, is meant to raise funds to assist archives that need assistance in the state, uh, and I encourage you to look them up on the Louisiana Historical Association's uh, website. Uh, all of this saying uh, that we have a lot of exciting things going on uh, in the next couple of weeks, including more from this lecture series uh, and workshop series, uh, as well as other department events, uh, and we hope that you'll join us for those. That ends my housekeeping reminders. <laughs> Um, before Summer Abu Kamra, uh, who is one of our graduate assistants right here, along with uh, Julia Fontenot uh, at the Gilbo, for Center, uh, Gilbo Center for Public History, introduces our speaker, I am going to introduce the other co-director, um, Dr. Miss Marissa Petru, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about land acknowledgement uh, initiatives happening at the Gilbo Center for Public History. Uh, so please uh, welcome Dr. Petru. Thank you so much, Dr. Skelton. Um, so I just want to talk about one of the initiatives for the center, the Gilbo Center for Public History, um, which is that we'd, we're trying to start including land acknowledgement as a regular practice in um, all of our events, as well as hoping to more broadly have the university include this um, in all of their events. The purpose of this is to acknowledge the history of settler colonialism, um, practices of which are ongoing today, which I'm sure we're gonna learn more about um, from our speaker, um, and also the ongoing history and continued existence of the numerous indigenous peoples who are on this land. Um, so I'll just uh, today give a brief statement. Um, before we begin our event, we would like to acknowledge the um, ancestors um, of the, sorry, I'm gonna start again. <laughs> Before we begin this event, we would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral land of the 24 different federally, state, and unrecognized tribes of the Louisiana region. We'd like to acknowledge that the, uh, we'd like to acknowledge the elders, both past, present, and future, for stewarding this land on which this event is being held. Um, I'd also like to say that the center has been working with other organizations and institutions such as the Vermilionville Living History Museum, as well as working with numerous of the indigenous uh, peoples and different Native American tribes in the region in order to understand better and learn more about the specific land acknowledgement protocols for each of these nations. If any of you know about them, we are very much interested in learning more, so please let us know. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Summer Abu Kamra. All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Our speaker today came all the way from Connecticut, Nakai Northup. He's a member of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum, and he works, uh, or he's a member of the tribe, and he also works at the Museum and Research Center in Connecticut in the Education Department. In addition to his work at the museum, he's a vice chairman of the Pequot Tribe's Natural Resource Committee. His disciplinary specialties include historic preservation, environmental indigenous activism, food sovereignty, and teaching Eastern woodland histories and life ways. So please welcome Nakai. Good morning. Um, Kwe Natasawis Nakai. Um, I come from southeastern Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island area as well. Um, grateful to be here. Glad for the opportunity. And um, let's see if I can make this a little bit taller. doesn't like me but um, anyways so I'm here to talk a little bit about our museum I'm going to talk about um, our curating and collections but I'm also going to get a little bit into our history um, because that's what I really specialize in and um, activism a bit and ways to stay relevant um, in the museum field so behind me I have a picture of our museum it is the largest Native American museum in the country um, and it is 308,000 square feet 
85,000 square feet of that is permanent exhibit space. Um, we have 35,000 square feet of temporary gallery space where we rotate different exhibits, um, rent out um, other exhibits to bring them in to try to keep it fresh. We have a 300 seat um, auditorium where we do talks similar to this, um, show native films, um, and also hold our travel meetings. We kind of use the museum for a little bit of everything. Thank you. Um, we are a Smithsonian affiliate, so anyone who is a member with the Smithsonian can come visit us for free as well. Um, what you're looking at here is our garden terrace. This is a green top roof, so we are doing a lot with ethnobotany and teaching of the plants in our local areas for medicinal uses. Um, so that area there is now all cultivated and in the spring we'll start planting our corn, our beans, our squash, our cordage plants to make um, different ropes. We'll have tobacco, um, blueberries, strawberries, everything will be up there and we do tours and little talks and programs on those items. Um, and to get more into the museum, we built the museum in 1998, so we're going on 21 years now. Um, and we put a lot of money into it. So a little bit of background on my tribe and my history. We are um, one of the first federally recognized tribes in the area. Um, and we live on the oldest continuously occupied reservation in North America. And we got our federal recognition in October of 1983. We put in our forms to get our federal recognition and Reagan denied us. And by an act of Congress, which is pretty rare, um, they pushed us through for our federal recognition, but we had more than enough history and criteria for this. Um, and we were a relatively smaller tribe at that time. Um, today we're only about 1,000 members, um, so not too large compared to some of the larger tribes that you'll see out west. And um, we started to grow and bring more people back to the land and more people started to come live on the reservation. Our reservation is uh, up on a hill. We have lots of rocks and we have red snakes, which are copperheads. Um, and majority of it is actually swampland. So it's not the most habitable um, area, but we make the most of it. And we got people to come back, people from all over the country, our family, who left because there wasn't work there on the reservation. It was really hard to survive. Um, and they came back and we were able to come together and we built a casino. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Foxwoods, um, but it's the largest casino on this side of the planet and my tribe owns it. Um, and with that, the first thing that we purchased after building the casino and starting to get money in is this museum. Um, and we built it from the ground up to tell our story from our perspective. Um, and that's really unique in our area. Um, a lot of native histories don't always get taught by native peoples. Um, so this is our opportunity to tell our story our way. The museum showcases most Eastern Woodland tribes, um, but the main storyline of the museum, if you ever go through and come visit, is focused on the Pequot history. And we go through about 20,000 years of history. Um, we have archives. We have a research department that is there full time. Um, so we have a group of archaeologists that are constantly researching, trying to give us fresh information, um, and we're still finding out more about um, our people. This 2,500 acre space which the museum is on in the reservation is considered an archaeological district. We have over 253 sites, um, and we have artifacts dating back more than 14,000 years right in Mashantucket. Um, so it's a pretty unique area. and. Um, one of my favorite places. I've been working there for six years now, but I'm a member of the community. I've been going there from, for the entirety of my life. Um, and this is where I kind of get a little frustrated with the museum. We are a profit museum, so we're not a nonprofit. We can't apply for um, 501c3 grants. And that's what's really holding us back at this point in time, um, because the tribe is paying the, for the function of the museum. Um, and at the peak, the museum was bringing in about 800 people a day. We were open seven days a week. Um, we had our restaurant running full time, gift store, um, 250 employees. Today, um, we have about 40 employees during the season and we're a seasonal um, museum and we run about from end of March to beginning of December. And we have about 40 core staff. 
from a building that was running with 250 core staff um, from the beginning. So we're learning to adapt a bit. Um, our budget got cut about completely in half. We went from running on an annual budget of about $5 million to running on 2.5. Um, and we're looking to condense that even more because we want the museum to go to a nonprofit. We're working on building, um, getting a board of directors so we can start pursuing 501c3 grants to make this museum um, back to its potential, which it could be. Um, it's still an amazing place. Our exhibits are world class. Um, and we try to keep it fresh. I actually had my curating debut um, this past year. I curated an exhibit um, called Our Family's Gifts with 20 local um, family artists and all contemporary, um, all styles of art. And it was a pretty unique opportunity there. Um, and with that, um, I mentioned we have our archeological team there. They are allowed to go for grants as well. Our TIPO, our Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, is also in-house. Um, and they are in control of our collections. Now, as far as our collections in this area, um, we have about a little over 2,000 objects in our collections. It has um, its own HVAC system connected to an electrical box, keeps it at about 70 degrees all, at all times, humidity monitored. If anything goes out of whack, an alarm goes off and it's taken care of. Um, Weather-wise, everything like that, we're kind of spoiled in the Northeast. Um, we get snow, we get some rain, and the occasional high winds. Um, so we are, have yet to have a real crisis. Our crisis is the fact of having people to man it and take care of it how it should be. And that's the crisis that we're fighting right now is um, having a team to really tend to our collections and right now um, it's more of a volunteer based system. Um, our TIPO, our Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, um, goes through and takes care of um, items. We also get some funding and we do some projects through NAGPRA, um, Native American Grave and Recreation, uh, Recreation Act. Um, and the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, anytime there's a shovel put in the ground on the reservation, even sites off reservation, we're notified if any um, human remains, artifacts, or anything like that are found, we have first say on who they belong to, so we consult with the local tribes. Um, in our area, we have four main tribes. It's ourselves, um, the Mohegans, Eastern Pequot, and the Scaticoke, who we can kind of talk about and go through of who these items belong to by where it was found. Um, and we also rent out space in our collections to other local tribes. So Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, we've donated space to to allow them to hold certain items. Um, and we're looking more into renting out space because the building's massive and we have tons of space in our collections right now and it's dead space essentially. So that's, that's really our problem that we have going on, um, is getting more funding and more people in the building to really tend to these objects. Because right now our collections are somewhat dormant. Um, we haven't taken much in lately. Um, our archeology, um, they are constantly researching, but they're researching off res now. Um, you're going to hear me talk a little slang. Res um, is reservation, and growing up on the reservation, we just all call it the res. Um, and this is something that, I mean, we are we're working towards and becoming a nonprofit and a 501c3 um, to go be able to go for these grants would really help solve a lot of these problems. The tribe will still put in funding, um, but we have a full museum. Um, museum library and we have a children's library as well with all Native American authors early writings um, on the local tribes we have our archives upstairs which that is I mean that's what we really need to focus on there we haven't had anyone assigned to our library or our archives upstairs in the past five years since I've been there um, so that's that's the crisis that the Mashantucket Pequot Museum is going through and that's the things that we're looking at and we're trying to focus on growing um, to really get to our full potential in that area. Um, and 
we're, like I said, looking to stay relevant. So with grant funding, we're going to be able to bring in more temporary exhibits and rent out more exhibits, more traveling exhibits to get membership more excited, to get the local area more excited. Right now, the majority of our visitors at the museum are school groups, um, summer programs, and that's the majority of them. We get a decent amount of general public, and we need to tap more into the, the younger generation we have. Literally, if you look at this picture, directly across in the pine trees, the casino's right there. The casino's within a mile of this area. And to bring more people in, we actually just built a zip line off the top of the casino that comes right down to the museum. Um, it's about a mile long, and yeah, I, we're trying everything right now. Um, we're, we're shooting you down there. Um, and it's a mile long zip line, and it goes about 60 miles per hour. Um, you're about 330 feet up in the air once you get to the top of one of our casinos, and it shoots you right down to the bottom of the museum. We have a store, and we, we try to get you in there. Um, we've been doing some pretty cool things at the museum. We just had a, a food sovereignty um, summit, and we had tribes from all over the country come and share um, their ways of food sovereignty. And food sovereignty and agriculture are things that are really starting to, to come back because we believe that if we follow our traditional diets, um, that diabetes is going to be eliminated in native communities. Um, high blood pressure, um, all these sicknesses that we're suffering um, really can be eliminated by what you eat. Um, traditionally, 500 years ago, if I wanted strawberries, I had to wait till June. If I wanted blueberries to eat, I had to wait till July. Um, I couldn't just go to Stop and Shop and go grab them whenever I wanted. So if we eat more into our seasonal diet and our items that the land offers us, um, we will be healthier people. And we had a huge summit and good turnout, tons of um, traditional um, and like celebrity native chefs came and cooked us all this awesome gourmet food. Because when you say, yeah, I'm going to cook you a duck, some people are like, whoa. Um, or I'm going to give you a muskrat or something like that. And they're like, what are you giving to me? But when you plate it up and make it look nice and make it look unrecognizable to what it is, you're willing to give it a go. And it tastes a lot better than it sounds. Um, so that was a huge initiative that we had going. We have a cafeteria here, which we're trying to turn more into a restaurant style. Um, and when the museum first opened, they had hot dogs, hamburgers, and chicken tenders. You're coming to the largest Native American museum in the world, and you're, you're getting Burger King food. Um, so in 2015, we hired my aunt, Sherry Pockenick. And she's a Wampanoag chef, um, traditional chef. And she came in and she helped um, revamp the menu at the museum. And we were serving turtle soup, uh, clam chowder, um, fry bread, um, so Indian tacos. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's kind of like a dough boy with chili and stuff on top. Um, we were serving chowders. We were serving tons and tons of just traditional foods for our area, corn cakes. Um, and that is something that we're trying to focus on more. Our gift shop, we had a lot of um, objects that weren't native made. Um, dream catchers that were made in China and like little fur dolls that weren't made by the hands of the indigenous people of this land. So now we are strictly working on just selling native made objects and trying to fuel an economy that way. We hold markets and little things um, to try to create an economy for Native people. Um, in our area, we have about five or six local tribes, and we're all sister tribes. Our histories tie back to one another and interwine. Um, and we have veterans powwows and educational powwows where we teach, um, we teach the local and general public about what it's like to be at a powwow, what's going on, what you're looking at, because a lot of people think of a powwow as just a drum and music. Um, but our dances are telling stories, our food um, and our songs are important and special. And um, it's, it's, that's my favorite space. I don't know, that's, this is where I love to be. I come from a really, really big family. Um, living on the reservation, literally your neighbors are your cousins. 
Um, when I went to high school, I went to public school and I had 20 cousins in school with me. Um, so you're surrounded by family full time. Your coworkers are your cousins. Your government are your cousins, your aunts and uncles. Um, so yeah, we get into feuds and headbutt um, and things like that, but it's a really, really cool environment on the reservation and to be in this area. Um, and even the local tribes I was mentioning, a lot of us are from multiple tribes. I'm Pequot and I'm Narragansett. Um, and I have family members that are Pequot, Narragansett, and Wampanoag, so just full mixed and intertwined. Um, and it's, it's a unique area and we have a unique story to tell. And our big thing that we need to do is find a way on how to, to grow more. Um, we built this massive building. It's always gonna have a big electric bill. You're always gonna have to have staff to clean it and you're always gonna have to have people who are going to help tend to this building. Um, that's something that we set ourselves up with when we decided to build a 308,000 square foot museum. Um, so we're working on that and really becoming a nonprofit and going for these grants are what's going to help us. Um, and that's gonna get people back in the building. Um, Tribal historic preservation, I'm gonna talk about that a bit. Um, Tribal Historic Preservation Officers through the National Park Service, they apply for a grant that provides funding for their office. Every year um, you apply for it, but it's a two-year grant. And not every federal, um, federally recognized tribe has a, a TIPO. And as soon as another tribe gets it, then the funding goes down. Um, so some TIPOs went from running on $100,000 a year for office to now they're running on 50,000. Um, and every year that a new TIPO is created, which is an awesome thing that another TIPO is coming in, but they just divide that into the budget. Um, so you're getting less and less funding. So a good portion of the money that TIPOs make come from doing outside projects with archeologists. Um, another big thing is the FCC. Um, anytime there's a cell tower put in, or any um, ground disturbance, the tribes get consulted with. And they go out and they check and they look at maps and see if there's anything of um, historical significance there. And they get compensated for it. And that helps fund the office. Um, land use on reservation, anytime there's a house built um, or we're putting in a new road or anything like that, then our TIPO is brought out. Um, or if there's any large developments going on off reservation and any human remains or anything like that are found, um, we get a call. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Title VI. Title VI within um, NAGPRA and getting into that is the tribes are the experts in this. So when we get consulted with, it's because we're the experts in this situation. No one can tell us what is our tribe's artifacts and what's not. And that's a huge thing that helps us fight um, with different land disturbances. We're using it to fight um, a railroad that's gonna go through a part of our reservation in Rhode Island. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a good weapon for us to use. Um, activism, activism is something that, I'm a pretty shy, mellow guy. Um, I was always quiet, didn't really talk too much, and never expected to speak for a living. Um, and it just kind of happened one day. I applied at the museum. I have always worked in traditional work, um, Eastern Woodland teachings. Um, I was raised living off the land since I can remember. I was out hunting with my father and my uncles, um, going to get clams, digging in the mud, going to get crabs. Um, going out and finding mushrooms in the woods. That's just how I was raised um, with being able to provide for yourself. And um, a couple years back, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, so I was sitting in the DMV. And if you're in the DMV, you're on your phone because what else is there to do? Um, and I'm sitting there with my wife and there's the whole thing going on with the attack dogs. Um, how the private security company had attack dogs go out and 
kind of help deal with the protesters. Well, the attack dogs attacked everybody, even the handlers. Um, and when I saw Native women being attacked by dogs and children, um, I said, you know what, I'm going to take a drive out to North Dakota. Um, so I called my boss and I said, hey, I'm not going to be in next week. I'm going to take the week off. And he's like, can I come with you? And I was like, sure. So we packed up in my mother-in-law's minivan. And I'm also the advisor for our tribe's youth council. Um, and I talked to a couple members of the tribal youth council. I raised some money up. Um, we brought food. We bought clothes. We brought um, some different donations from the community. And we drove the 34 plus hour drive to North Dakota, um, in which my partners who drove with me didn't really take up the load of helping me drive too much. Um, but nonetheless, we made it. And I pull into this camp. You come around the corner on this long road in North Dakota. I don't know if you guys have driven out west much, but if you like driving like this for four hours and not moving your arms on a straight road with nothing but fields next to you, go take a drive out in North Dakota. Um, and we come around the corner and then out of nowhere there's beautiful hills and you come around a little bit more and there's three, 4,000 tents. Um, tons of cars, horses, kids running around and flags of hundreds of tribal nations. So I pull in and I had some family go out before me and they had literally just left. We crossed them in Chicago when we were heading out. Um, they had just left the day before and we pull into where they had set up camp and I open the door and get out of the car and I'm swarmed by a bunch of people and they're saying, can we help you set up your tent? Hey, you're coming over here to have dinner with me tonight. And one kid rides up on a horse, and none of these horses have saddles or anything like that. And they're like, hey, do you want to ride my horse? Like how you'd pull up to someone and say, hey, do you want to ride my bike? Um, and I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll ride your horse. Um, they didn't tell me that the horses don't speak English and, like, don't, of course, they don't speak English, understand English. So when you say no and slow down and anything like that, and the horse is like, yes, yeah, um, screw you, I'm heading this way still. Um, we kind of had to deal with that a bit and adjust to that. but. The camp wasn't really how it was portrayed, and I don't understand why I was driving into that camp, there was National Guard on the road with machine guns and Humvees and road blockades. And when I got there, there's a big sign right when you pull into the camp, and it says, no alcohol, no drugs, no weapons. Pull into camp, and you don't see that. There's children running around playing. Um, there's people chopping wood. There's a guy in a truck, a pickup truck, every morning who drives and picks up everyone's garbage from their campsite. Um, and people who drive by in other trucks with wood for everyone um, for their campsites. Um, and it was people praying. It was people sharing their cultures. Every night at the main center fire, um, people were sharing their different beliefs because we all are native people, but we're different. Um, we speak different languages. We have different... Um, beliefs um, and we were sharing them with each other and then when we were going to the front line to deal with the problems that we were facing um, it was rough the people in the local town were able to say no we don't want this pipeline going through here and then they said all right we'll put it through the reservation and under the river and a lot of people look at this fight and they don't realize that 18 million people are affected by that river for drinking water. So it's not 18 million native people, it's 18 million people. Um, so we weren't just fighting for native people, we were fighting for everyone because there's not one person who's been born that can't survive without water. Um, everyone needs water to survive. And that was our fight. Um, and it was a peaceful one on our behalf. But I don't have the picture on me. I should have put it in my slideshow that I'm going to show you guys. But my cousin got shot with a rubber bullet in the thigh. They were out in 20 degree weather. My cousins went out there and built a school, um, a traditional school and a traditional style we too. And um, they were out in 20 degree weather getting sprayed with fire hoses and tear gas, um, rubber bullets and shotguns. Um, 
for drumming and singing honor songs and traditional songs to try to fight to protect this water. Um, other things of activism which weren't as extreme as that, that was really one of the most amazing experiences of my life, um, going out there and being with 5,000 other people um, in a community that was started by the youth. A lot of these initiatives that you see going on um, in native country and even in America are started by our youth. Um, and they're really starting to, to let their voices be heard and um, be encouraged. Another thing that we fought for recently, um, we marched in DC because the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe had um, their land base taken from them. This is the same tribe which everyone here who went to elementary school probably learned about Plymouth Rock in the first Thanksgiving. Um, that's the tribe who said, hey, you can come here and we'll teach you how to plant corn and we'll help you survive. And now today they're taking their land base because they don't want them to have a casino and they don't want them to be financially stable, I guess. Um, so we went to DC and we marched um, for the right for our people to have this land, which is, um, it's 168 acres, I believe, what they're fighting for. That, it's not a lot of land. Um, it's in Taunton, Mass. And that's, that's what they were, were pushing and fighting for. Um, but things are getting better. Um, this past year, some cool experiences I had. Um, Connecticut College had us come and sing our flag song at their um, graduation. Um, UConn started working on a land acknowledgement. Um, and they're kind of leading the way in Connecticut for that. Um, Brown, um, Dartmouth, Yale, those schools, Harvard, are all holding powwows annually um, to honor Native peoples. Um, so it's starting to get out there a little bit more. People are starting to get more aware, um, which is helping. And I'm going to get a little bit into our history so you can see how this all came along. Um, my tribe at the peak was about 8,000 people. So still, compared to the Navajos today, that's it's a small amount. But at our peak, we were a thriving 8,000 um, strong. There are 26 known Pequot villages throughout southeastern New England. Um, we speak an Algonquin dialect. And um, we are a coastal people. Pequot translates to people of the shallow water. Um, we love our seafood. Um, for Valentine's Day or Mother's Day or anything like that. I don't buy my mom flowers. I buy her a lobster or something, um, and it works. Um, and we um, fought in the first war between a native nation and the English. And it's the Pequot War, 1636 to 1638. Um, and it's not really talked about too much, but it's really a big turning point in not just our history, but American history. Because if the English didn't win that war, then there are no 13 colonies, there is no America. Um, or at least it's backed up a bit in time and we're working on that again. But um, for the first year of that war, the Pequots didn't lose a battle to the English. And that's because we had very different fighting styles. The English were still in the method of say, hey, we're going to meet in this field tomorrow. We're going to march within 50 yards of each other, and we're going to yell fire with muskets. And we were like, OK, you just told us you're going to meet us in this field. We're going to meet you in the path along the way and take it to you. Um, so once the English said, you know what, we're going to get some native allies, um, they reached out to local tribes in the area and were able to get native allies because they offered money, power, and false protection in the long run, but they offered them protection saying that this won't come to your people. Um, and people gave in to that. And um, a big turning point in our history is May 26, 1637. And that's um, known as the Mystic Massacre. Um, in Mystic, Connecticut, directly, if you guys ever go to Connecticut and come visit me, um, the Mystic Seaport, if you look directly across from that, there's a big hill. And on that hill, 600 of my people died in an hour. And this is 600 people who died. Prior to the Pequot War, we lost half of our population to disease. Um, smallpox, measles, mumps, things along those lines. Um, 
at the time of the Pequot War in 1636, it said that we only had about 1,000 fighting men because 4,000 of our people just died to disease. Um, so we were already at a weakened state at the time of the war, but there were things that war kind of was inevitable at that time. There were just things that we couldn't agree on that if you don't agree on, you're going to fight. Um, and so we lost 600 people in an hour in that attack. And the attack was with the English, of course, Captain um, John Mason, who Mason's Island is named after in Connecticut, um, led the attack. And he wasn't expecting such a big fight back from the Pequots because they snuck up on the village at about three, four in the morning. Um, and they went inside to go fight these people in a palisaded fort, um, circular fort, which is something that um, isn't smart military-wise is to have a circle fort because it's almost impossible to defend because you're only defending that little area that you can see through as opposed to a rectangular or a square fort with bastions at the end where you can stand out and defend whole walls. Um, and we learned that the hard way, but they snuck in and they attacked and they weren't expecting such a big attack, so they said, you know what, we'll burn it down. There's only one way in and out of those forts. It's kind of like a maze almost, but there's this path. They lit all their homes on fire, which at this time it's summertime, so our homes are covered with cattail reeds. They will light up pretty fast if it's been dry for a while. Um, and they ran out. And then while everyone inside is getting burned, if they don't want to get burned, of course they're going to run out. They had that circular fort surrounded with men. So they just opened fire at any time someone ran out. So it was, it was a huge slaughter. And people call it the mystic fort, that village. Um, but a fort is, is military. There were women, children, elders inside of this um, village. So it was not a fort. And that's something that you will commonly see on write-ups about this event. Um, but that's a turning point in our history. After this event, um, my people um, were sold into slavery. We were split up. Because of this event right here, there are two Pequot tribes today. And one is federally recognized, the Mashantucket Pequot tribe, and the other is state recognized because of a document that was signed and put to order by the King of England. Um, so there's a document today that's still upheld that was by the King of England in 1637. Um, and that's called the Hartford Treaty. Um, Hartford is the capital of Connecticut. and the Hartford's Treaty basically states that the Pequot people can no longer live on their land, call themselves Pequots, or speak their language. If they do any of the following, they're going to be killed. Um, half the Pequots are then sent to live with the Mohegans. The other half are sent to go live with the Narragansetts. And that's how we have two different Pequot tribes today. The half that went to go live with the Narragansetts are on the east side of the Pawcatuck River. So they're the eastern Pequots. They live today a mile away from us, right down the road from us. Dirt roads, no casino, um, no federal funding or anything like that. Um, they actually won their federal recognition, but Connecticut is one of the only states to have taken federal recognition away from a tribe, and they've done it twice. Um, they took it away from the Eastern Pequots, and they've taken it away from the Scaticoke, um, which are more up towards New York. And a small portion of my people were actually sent to Bermuda um, as slaves, and we actually reconnected with them in the early 2000s. And every other year, we go out and see them, or they come and see us. Um, so we've reconnected with them. Because of that document, my tribe has lost its language. We, have, we don't have too many fluent speakers in our language in our community. Out of a 1,000, I give you a handful that can speak the language fluently. Right now, we're still in the rebuilding process of that. Um, and today, we have our child development center, which is an awesome place. Um, it's a daycare for our children, and they go in there and they get their normal education that you're going to get out of daycare. Um, so you're learning your shapes and your colors and things along those lines. But they're also getting a cultural class, and they're learning their traditional songs and their traditional dances, and they're learning their language now. Um, and we have classes for our older people as well. So now we are getting immersed in our language, and we're bringing it back. It's being revived. I don't think it's going to be... Um, maybe my generation, but the generation below, we're going to have a whole bunch of um, fluent speakers in our language. Um, and we're cultivating that and we're working on that more. Um, and like I mentioned earlier with the food sovereignty, um, we're starting to eat our traditional foods more. 
Um, we didn't have breads here. Um, we didn't have milk or anything like that. We have a lot of meat. Um, I always tell people, I do survival classes and stuff like that as well. Um, my cousins always try to get me to like sign up for Survivor and stuff like that. Um, but I always tell people, southeastern New England is one of the hardest places to starve in the world. If you ever get lost there, you really have to, if you don't know it well, you have to try to starve yourself to starve. Um, we have the coast, which there's lobsters, crabs, clams, um, just everything you can imagine, all the fish there in that ocean. We have our rivers with trout, um, ponds with bass. We have woods with, at one point in time, the state of Rhode Island was letting hunters shoot 11 deer in a season, um, which most states, it's one or two that you can shoot in a season. You could hunt 11 deer in a season in Rhode Island. Um, and Block Island, which is an island right off the coast of Rhode Island, was actually hiring people $1,000 to shoot a deer because the people didn't like them eating their garden out on the island. Um, we have corn, beans, and squash, which are known as the Three Sisters, um, important crops to our people. Um, strawberries, blueberries, we have cranberries, um, acorns, hazelnuts, chestnuts, all this stuff. So it's really an abundant area as far as food source where you don't really have to worry too much. Um, and that's, that's what we do in that area. Um, our children are brought out at a young age. My daughter, which I'll show you a, a pretty cool picture of her. She's pretty funny. Um, her favorite food is duck um, and deer meat and things like this. So when you go ask most kids, they want chicken tenders and french fries and stuff like that. If I say, hey, love, what do you want for dinner tonight? She said, Dad, I want a duck. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess that's what we're having tonight. Um, and she, it's all about teaching our youth. That's what we're, we're focusing on now, our younger generation. Um, and our elders are helping with that. Our elders are passing on traditional practices and teaching these ways because um, we're in a time where of course we have our technology. I have my iPhone and my MacBook and I drive a car, um, but we still stay in touch with our traditional backgrounds and that's where tribes are pretty unique um, because most people um, come from hunter-gathering backgrounds. If you go back far enough in your history, um, they come from a traditional lifestyle, but they don't really acknowledge it too much. Um, and we're relatively fresh in that within the past 500 years or so, just coming from that till today. Um, it's something that we're still fighting for, we're still honoring and still doing. Um, and we're doing it without very little recognition still. Um, Native people are today 1% of this land's population, um, where they were 100% at one time, and today we're 1%. We're the highest serving per capita race in the military. Um, a lot of people cut our population down by a huge portion because Native people aren't just in um, the United States. There's a huge population of Native people in Canada that we don't add to our population because it's in Canada, but they're the same people as us. There's a huge population of Native people in Mexico, but they're Mexican to us. They're not Native American, but if you take their blood in a DNA test, it's not going to say Mexican, it's going to say Native American. Um, and their life ways and practices are really similar to our people here. And you go down into Guatemala and more into Central America, and those are all native people. So our population is much more than the 1% that we say on our census reports. Um, and we're much bigger than that. Once we realize that and we're able to really connect, I feel like native people can offer a lot um, for our country um, and our, our planet because we were stewards to this land, like we mentioned before, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and we believe we were born to this land. So I'm gonna show you guys a few pictures and I wanna open it up for questions. Um, ask me just about anything you want. All right, so I'm gonna show you guys just a couple pictures. This is the museum, like I mentioned before, that big space that you see there with the, the mirrors, that's called the gathering space. We have weddings there. Um, a couple years back, we had an India, um, an Indian wedding, but Indian from India, um, and it was two days long, and the groom rode in on a horse and like 
carried in on couches. It was really extravagant. It's a pretty cool space. We've had like Circus Olay, so the people who hang from the walls and stuff. Um, we have our powwows in there, um, different speeches. It's our tribal inauguration is there. This is an aerial view. So like I mentioned, it is a really large building. Um, our tower there, observation tower, is about 185 feet tall. Um, that back section there where you see the trails, that is our farmstead area. So that displays life in the 1700s when people were more into an agricultural style living in the area. You can see the roof, um, the green top roof. This photo here is a photo that was taken about 20 years ago. And this is in front of our last standing farmstead on the reservation. Um, and we're actually looking into grant funding now to try to um, renovate it and save it a bit because these winters are kind of rough on these old buildings and there's actually a farmstead about 200 yards behind this that collapsed a couple years back um, because of weather wear and time but everyone in that picture is a member of the Mashantucket Pequot community and when people look at our community um, we're a very diverse people um, but everyone in this people um, in this picture are a member of our community. We have 11 family lines that make up the Pequot tribe. And to be a member of our tribe, it's not by blood quantum. Um, blood quantum is another way to get rid of our people. Um, and we do by lineal descent. So if you're able to trace someone back, um, your bloodline back to someone on our base roles, then you can be a part of our community. Um, so like I said, today we're a little over 1,000 members and growing. This is a picture that we take annually every year. Um, at Pequot Days, and that's a kind of a big family cookout that we do for the remembrance that we're still here today, that we survived going through a genocide, um, a genocide that's not admitted to. Um, but our, we went through war, we went through slavery, we went through assimilation, um, and we're still here today. So we have a big celebration for that. Um, some of my family, um, we have our powwow every year at the end of August. Um, that's my cousin Adequin there dancing. Um, and our powwows are a really beautiful thing. It's a time to come out and we have, um, of course, tons of beautiful different styles of dance. Um, awesome, awesome food if you want to come out and try traditional foods. Um, awesome songs. So you hear world class drummers um, singing their songs. You'll be able to get a peek into into our life. So it's a really, really cool time. Um, like I said, we're empowering our youth um, and we're teaching our youth. So we start them young. And the beautiful thing is a lot of people ask how to dance. How do you dance these styles? You can't teach someone this. Um, our children, when they hear the drum, it's just natural. They naturally start to go and start to dance. You don't teach a child to dance. Um, they watch and learn. A bear learns how to be a bear from a bear. Same with a child so they watch us and they learn but it's it's in them right off the bat um, this is our tribal council um, our youth council in the back and also our our elders council so we have three councils in our community um, tribal council of course handles all government and they also handle our um, business and then elders council deals with just about everything they if there's a problem in the community you go to the elders and they help um, deal with it and straighten it out. Um, and then the Youth Council, we are up and coming. We were kind of dormant for a while, but we were able to jumpstart it. Um, last year, we attended a conference in San Diego, Unity, which is the largest native youth conference in the country. And we have real business meetings. We are going in there, um, taking meeting minutes. We're having action items. Um, and we're learning how to function at a high level. Um, this youth council is an amazing group. Uh, we hold events for our community. We had a graduation party for our kids last year. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool opportunity to work with them as well. Here's another picture of the youth council. Um, so myself there at the end and then in the middle, my sister, we are the advisors. And then my other cousin at the end, Philip, is our treasurer. My sister, Fatia, right there, who's Mission Mass and Tucket, um, is the advisor. Um, Lynette here is our um, council member. And then Le Lay is our secretary. And Shaquana is our chairwoman. And they do excellent work. Um, this is 
a dugout canoe that we built. And in my language, dugout canoe is machoon. And um, it's a 36 footer. It's the largest traditional dugout canoe built in New England in the past 200 plus years. Um, and we made it traditionally. We cut a tree down, peeled the bark, um, popped the top off, lit a fire inside, and let it burn. Um, about 10 days of burning, um, two days of handwork, so scraping it and fine tuning it. And we have this dugout canoe, and we did it the finishing touches over at the Mystic Seaport, and I had people come on, coming up to me like, are you sure it's gonna float? It's, it's not gonna sink, right? And I would tell them, it's okay, we've been doing this for thousands of years. Um, I said, have you ever thrown a stick in the water? And they, they got to see it when we finally put it in the water. Um, we fit 14 people in it at the most, um, our first journey. It turns like a Cadillac, um, <laughs> not built for speed too much, but it, it gets where you need to go. This is an ocean-going vessel. Um, at the time when Europeans first arrived, they were up to 80 feet in length um, when we had old growth trees in New England. If you go to New England, all the forests are new growth forests because when the Europeans arrived, they clear cut most of the land to make it into pastures and farmland. Um, so you don't really see old, old trees there. Um, this is a talk that I was doing there. Um, we had a group of voyagers from Hawaii come and visit us and we paddled out in our dugout canoe, our machine to meet them. And they came to see us and they circumnavigated the entire globe um, by wayfinding. Like I so you know Moana. Yeah, that's, that's what they, but they really did it. Um, and they went all over the planet um, and they stopped in Mystic to see us, which was a pretty cool opportunity. Um, this is one of our powwows. This is my Narragansett powwow. So, I kind of have the best of both worlds, I always say. I'm Pequot and Narragansett. Pequot, I always tell people my reservation is a unicorn. Um, we have the largest casino in the world, the largest Native American museum. We have paved roads, houses. We have a community center with a pool inside and a basketball court. My Narragansett reservation, it's the woods. Um, and growing up as a child, we were cutting wood to throw in the wood stove, and we were um, Going. This, that's where I learned how to hunt. That's where I learned how to fish is on my Nar um, Narragansett reservation. And this is, this is a prime example of what we love to do, um, is get our youth involved and get them out there so they can carry us one day. That's my daughter, Silver Miss Grace. Um, and she loves her Doc McStuffins, so she brought her puppy out to dance with her. Um, and She's got a pretty stoic look on, and she's got her fan, but she's hilarious, and she had to bring that puppy or else she wasn't going out there, so I had to, to sacrifice. But here, um, like I said, we're working more on agriculture. Our tribe's finally getting an agricultural department. We are looking into a lot of different avenues, um, and our child development center, we're growing the um, crops for the kids. So when they eat lunch in the afternoon, they're eating something that they helped plant from a seed and they watered and they grew until um, it's ready for them to eat. And it's a really, really cool opportunity. The kids love to get outside and play in the dirt a bit as well. This is another picture of it. And we also teach them the traditional um, word for the plant, for the berries and things along those lines. So a lot of these kids, there's one, um, that we had 24 different plants out there and could name every one in the language by the time we were done. So like I said, we hunt, um, and my daughter's gonna ask for duck, deer, anything along those lines, and this is something as a kid that I was used to. Um, I'd come home from school, and this is what I'm gonna see in my garage or something like that. Um, to tog, blackfish, so the ocean, you can see right behind me, that's, that's our home. Um, Pequot means people of the shallow water. Narragansett is people of the small point. We're coastal people, and right now, back home, it's cold and a foot of snow on the ground, and I can't wait to go jump in the ocean for it to warm up. Um, we're really wishing and hoping for that. Blue shell crabs, I know you guys have, have crab boils and stuff down here, so I had to throw some blue crabs in there, but this is just more substance. Um, this is something that we still carry on to this day. Um, and we're still trying to pursue. So I'm going to open it up for questions, anything you guys would like to ask. If I want, I can put a mic out in the crowd, anything like that.
Um, I have a question about your research center. Are y'all open to the public, or is it just for tribal members? We're open to the public. Okay. So public come in, and they bring in artifacts. Um, they bring in questions, anything they are interested in, they come in, and someone from the research department can talk to them. I have a question about the size of your research center. I mean, your holdings, your papers. Yeah. Can you give me an estimate, like how many linear feet or how many? Our research department is on the second level of our museum. We have an x-ray room. We have, of course, all our collections, which is on the first level of our museum. We have two labs, um, which How many are, boxes of material? Like, can you? OK. A lot. Okay. A, a, a lot. Like, w down in collections is where we bring everything to store, and it's two whole rows that are longer than this room. And the racks are full. It's a, it's a lot of items. I couldn't give an exact one, though. Um, I had a question about oral history collection and if you have any ongoing projects. Yep. And um, in addition to that, and more specifically, any ethnobotany projects. Yep, so oral histories, we're working on a little series now of going and talking to our elders. Um, that's something that we often neglect nowadays, is going and sitting down and talking with our grandparents. Um, and listening to how they grew up um, and listening to the stories that their grandparents told them um, because oral histories um, we don't realize that once they're gone they're gone um, the only way to keep them alive is to keep passing them on so we're actually going and we're doing a project where we're bringing in elders and we're going to start recording these stories um, to save them in our archives and we have done that in the past a bit as well um, ethnobotany um, that's kind of up my alley so we're doing nature walks coming up in the spring. We have the ethnobotany garden that we're putting on top of the museum here um, that's been going on for the past two years, and we do little tours in that area. Um, and that's something else that I do talks about as well, is focusing on the local plants in the area. Right. And do you have a culture camp for kids in the summertime, or is it more the daycare, so, school? Like non-tribal kids? No, or tribal kids don't. Our tribal kids, so our tribal kids, we have a summer camp, mm -hmm. um, and they come to the museum about once a week, mm -hmm. and we'll bring them, spend an hour with them, and bring them through. They have culture class as well um, with our cultural department on the reservation. Um, so our community center, that's where our tribal government works, that's where we have, um, it's the hub for our community, so that's where our suburb camp is, and we have a cultural department there who also teaches tribal education just like myself. Right, okay, I know that like, down in Lower Lafourche and Terrebonne and the tribes there, they'll do summer camps just for tribal kids. But one of the things that they um, do is they bring their elders in, even yeah. though the kids might know them all, it might even be your own grandparents. Mm -hmm. But they end up talking about things with them that they don't in the grandparent-grandchild relationship right. normally. And it's been hugely successful in also recalling stories that even after multiple oral histories, just certain odd things just didn't come up, mm -hmm. but a child asking this question right. and um, something yeah, something triggered and something yeah. else and and everybody's very comfortable. So it's, it's not, um, it's much more conversational, which also engenders more, yep. more stories that, yep. through that. We have, um, so at our daycare, our elders will sometimes go down to read a book or mm -hmm. um, do some cultural lesson with them as well. Um, but it's definitely something that we're working on. Yeah. Um, what would you say is your favorite work that you're doing with the museum right now? All right, so right now is our slow season. Um, so right now, I've just been working on a lot of programs, trying to revamp, um, because some of our programs are the same programs that have been scripted from 21 years ago. Um, so I've been working on some new programs. I'm working on some more modern things, um, because when people think of Native Americans, if you type in Native American on Google, it's not gonna be someone dressed like me right now, it's gonna be someone in their traditional wear from 500 years ago. But if I type in Italian American, African American, anything like that, it's gonna be a traditionally dressed, uh, a normally dressed person how I am today. So I'm working on a program now that shows that we are modern people, that we have adapted, but we still are intact with our traditional lives. So that's something I'm 
pretty excited for. Um, so one of the things that you had mentioned before is that you have an issue with uh, not enough people working at the museum. You went from 250 to 40, was it? Yep. Uh, what are what are some of the issues that you're having? Is it that they uh, not trained staff or you know too much work and not enough people? So for the most part, it's too much work, not enough people. Our funding getting cut, that was a huge thing to us. Um, we don't have too many docents, which that kind of hurts it a bit. Um, but we're working on a program now to get some of our elders in the building um, because who better to learn our history from than our elders and who better to go through and help out in the museum. Um, but the real thing is funding. Once we're able to flip over to a, a 501c3 and start bringing in grant funding and we can start working and revamping our library and our archives, um, the functionality of the museum is going to be so much better. That's, that's our biggest issue right now is we don't have the funding to fully operate that museum at its potential. And. Um do, is everyone that works at the museum, are they part of the tribe, or do you have people that are not part of the tribe? Working? So we have non-tribal as well. Um, it's a mix. So speaking of funding, I was curious about you turning into a nonprofit and what, how you're going about that and what issues you're running into, and also is there controversy within the tribe of doing that? So one thing about not being a nonprofit is that we have full control over that museum. Um, without a board of directors, um, it's whatever we want in that museum we can put in there. Um, and I think there was a fear of if we had a board of directors that it wouldn't always be the tribe's vision. Um, but over the past two or three years or so, there's been much more talks into to revamping and finally getting that board of directors and also creating a team of um, all tribal members to focus on, fun, um, focus on the context of what's in the museum. So I, we're making progress. Um, it's going to happen sooner than later at this point, which there, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And once we get there, I, I'll be happy. I'll be, I'll be proud of it. And are there specific grants that you could apply for as a Native American museum? that are specific to that, that you're trying, that you're hoping for? Or? We, at this point, want any grant that we can get. <laughs> um, anything to really help. Um, like right now, like I said, typically we're seasonal. Right now we are in our closure, but usually on Wednesdays um, we have Foxwoods, our casino, we have orientation. And the first day of Foxwoods orientation is you learn about the people that you're working for. Um, so they come to the museum and they go through the exhibits. Right now we're in a closure and we're revamping everything, trying to, to get everything ready. Um, but we need exhibits, um, we need new temporary exhibits, we need funding to bring in um, rotating exhibits because right now if you come to the museum you're going to see the same exhibits that you saw 20 years ago if you came 20 years ago. Um, there are a couple sections that have some newer things um, and I just curated that exhibit um, in August, but we, we kind of need a facelift a bit. So any grants that can help with that, any grants that can help with funding that we can get more staffing in the building, that we can um, kind of push more for our membership to get more docents and things along those lines, um, that's, that's what we need the most. So we're open to any grant that can help with that. Is yours also about the 501c3? Uh, no. Okay. So I also wanted to ask about this 501c3 and whether um, because it's, if you're dealing with additional complications because you're a tribal museum specifically, uh, um, and then what about, are you able to partner with existing 501c3s and could they apply for the grant to then bring a traveling exhibit to you um, mm -hmm. or are you doubly penalized? That's something that we're looking into right now. So that's something that has newly been put on our drawing board is a possible partnership. So that's, that's another avenue that we're looking at instead of fully going into a 501c3 um, is partnerships. Uh, I think it's interesting uh, in this 
this larger series, our first week looked at storage concerns as the primary archives and crisis concern. So that's their crisis. And, and you're talking about the fact that you do not have a storage concern, yeah. but you have a people concern. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the reaction to some of the non-traditional methods to encourage people to not only come, but also to grow the funding side of things. So I'm curious about the reaction to the introduction of the native foods in particular and the zip line, which is probably the most creative, yeah. non-traditional route I've heard of to draw people to a museum. And I think we should consider it for Lafayette. That's, that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that out there. So the food, um, that received a huge reception from local, um, the public and um, our museum members. Um, they loved it. We were holding, we hold an event now called Feast around Thanksgiving every year, and it's a traditional Thanksgiving. Um, you're getting striped bass, you're, of course you're gonna get your turkey, but you're getting venison, you're getting the real deal of like traditional native foods for a meal, and that's been coming along. Um, the food aspect, everyone loves food, and today with social media, um, most people before they take a bite of their plate, they're putting up a picture on Instagram or Snapchat. Um, so that helped with it as well. Um, so right now our restaurant is at a, at a pretty decent point um, and it's helping bring in people. Um, it still needs growth. Um, we can still do more. And the zip line, um, I mean, I guess we're going for anything at this point. Um, the casino, they, like I said, we're working towards the casino as well with the casino. Um, but we don't want the museum to be fully focused on the casino. We want it to be its own entity. Um, so Foxwoods is working on being more into this younger generation because I was talking with Summer earlier. We don't really go gamble. Um, we, don't, we don't have the money to just go put it in a slot machine. So gaming is is not really the high suit right now. It's an oversaturated market, especially if you go to New England now. Um, we have our casino 15 minutes away from us. Mohegan has a casino. Um, our casino up to date over the past, we're going on 27 years now, has paid $4 billion to the state of Connecticut because we pay them 25% of our slot revenue. Um, we were offering at 1.16 thousand jobs. Um, we've donated tons and tons of money on top of that four billion to local towns. Um, we do work with the Mystic Aquarium, which is an awesome aquarium in that area. Um, so we're working on trying to become even more relevant in that business as well. Um, ways to keep growing and keep getting people in the doors because we, one thing about us is we're not in a heavily populated area. When you come to our museum, in our casino, you get off of 95, the highway there, and you drive for 15 minutes through the woods. And once you get to a path, it opens up and it's a massive casino and a big museum. Um, but like, this is all woods around us. It's all swamp and pine trees. It's not Atlantic City or Vegas or anything like that. You're, you're kind of out there. So working on getting people in. Well, I tell you, I'll, I'll visit to take a yes. zip line to yes. a museum. I mean, hello. <laughs> we would love it. I wanted to go back to your comments about revamping the exhibits and spending this time and have a couple of questions on that. And I realize that you're also looking at funding, but as you're thinking ahead or you have your wish list or short-term, long-term projects, how much you're looking at digital interactive, how much right. you're looking at bringing some of those documents out, um, you know, making it more tangible rather than static. Mm -hmm. And then I wondered also with your either current exhibits or your idea for future exhibits, how far up to the present day do you go? Because as you alluded to or just mentioned actually, there is that huge problem of seeing indigenous people as living people. Um, and is this something, and it's you know, a dialogue that we have in our classes, and it's usually the thing that shocks them the most, because mm -hmm. what they have in their heads is a 1950s Western movie. Right. Um, and so is there, is there like a, going back to like almost activism and mission statements of, of, of 
looking past but also looking future or is that already there or what's so, happening? Right now, our museum, it covers 20,000 years of history and it comes up until about the 1980s. It gets up to our federal recognition and then there's a gallery of tribal members after that, of just their pictures of tribal members today. So it brings it up somewhat to modern day, but it doesn't talk about anything. It's just pictures of tribal members. Um, so that's something that we need to do is we want to work on something to touch more on today's modern events with native people. Um, and we also, the story is, um, we want to involve more tribes, um, more of the Eastern Woodland tribes in the area to get some of their histories in there as well because it is such a massive building. Um, interactives, we, if you book a tour um, with an educator, we have a hands-on bag with us and we have like a beaver pelt and, um, jawbone and clamshell and things like that that after the tour we go through and you can touch but there's not much for you to really interact with at the museum and that's something else that I feel like we could really use because we do get a lot of children like I said the majority of our visitors are school groups and things like that and they come in and they we have one part of the museum which I didn't put a picture because you guys have to come to the museum I didn't put any inside pictures because you guys got to come to the museum to see the inside um, and it's a half acre of exhibit space and it's a life-size representation of everyday life in a Pequot village. So there's trees, there's weetus, there's people, um, life cast mannequins of people working in gardens, paddling canoes, building their homes, weaving gnats, um, feeding their children, um, just showing everyday life. And you can't touch anything in there. If you, if you touch it, you're in trouble, but <laughs> they go through the whole museum and they're like, they want to touch something, they want to be able to interact with it um, and not just look at it from behind a perimeter. Um, so that's something that I feel like we really lack and that's something that we really need to push for and if we are able to get more grant funding, I think the first exhibit that we should do is something with more interactives. We have some touch screens, um, but it's not the same thing. They, it would be nice for them to really get a feel on it. And what was the other part? No, that, I mean, that kind of covers it. I just had one other question. It says, we were talking about environmentalism, and it was like part of the, for today's lecture, and here we have threats to the community that are coastal erosion, land subsidence, hurricanes, um, and you mentioned, well, you have snow, you have this and that. So then I wondered about, are there threats to your community? They don't necessarily have to be environmental, but other ones um, that you work together to combat. Um, what they are, or if it's you no know, community's doing fine, and it's there's nothing really beyond the normal things that affect all of us. So, I mean, we have to deal with like looters and stuff like that with like traditional sites. So a lot of times when we find a historical site, um, we don't mark it or anything like that because once you mark it, it's a target, um, and people come and dig it up and take things from it. So that's one thing that we deal with and. We're working towards that. Um, threats to the community, I mean, other than, um, trying to find a working relationship with our government today in America. Um, that's, that's something that we're working on with BIA funding and, um, historically we don't, have a good relationship with our current president because we own a casino he was in the casino business and he didn't agree with certain things we can do but one thing that we can't do um, is file for bankruptcy as a casino um, and if we could it would we'd probably have more funding for the museum um, but that's something that others are allowed to do um, and he's gone on record and just said some things about my tribe personally that doesn't really sit too well with us. He said that we don't look like Indians to Indians and we don't look like, we don't look like Indians to him and we don't look like Indians to Indians. Um, and he called us Michael Jordan Indians. And so trying to find a working relationship with the government now is something that um, is a top priority with us because um, there's, you see what's happening with Mashpee now, their land base was taken away. Um, that's something that it's going to affect us drastically if that ever happened to us. Um, but as far as nature, nature's been 
pretty pretty good to us. We have um, a pest, um, the emerald ash borer, and it's eating all of our ash trees, and ash is what we use to make our baskets. Um, and if you spray a pesticide, it kills your honeybees and other things like that. So we're kind of stuck on what to do with that. Um, you can cut down the ash trees and sink them and they'll last and then when you need to use them for baskets and stuff like that you have them but you have to cut down your trees to do that so that's i guess one problem nature wise um gypsy moths um we do a lot of pest control in the museum because we have a lot of natural um, items inside with pelts and leather clothing on the um, life casts so pest control is something that we really don't mess around with. Um, we don't allow food or beverages down in the exhibits. Um, past a certain level in the museum, the employees can't bring coffee or anything into their office. Um, and you can't hold the door open at the museum to carry stuff in. So like if you are moving stuff into the museum, you can't just wedge the doors open and work and carry stuff in. You have to make sure that door is closed at all times, um, other than you just walking in. So. Pests are a bit of a problem. Um, so you mentioned that you are part of the federally recognized um, P quotes. So I'm interested in if you use uh, your museum to help to represent the state recognized tribe and whether you guys try to create initiatives or community building between the two because I'm sure there's lots of similarities more so than differences. So we're the same people. Um, they have the same last names as us, everything. We're the same people. Um, we teach their history museum um, because we're teaching our history. So we talk about how it was, we were separated. We talk about um, how we don't think we should be separated as a people. Um, and like I said, they're a mile down the road from us. So whenever we have events, they come and spend some time with us. Whenever they have events, um, we go see them, like their powwow and our powwow. Um, our governments work together um, because they're a state recognized tribe. They're not federally recognized, but they still have a tribal council. So they have some funding and some initiatives, and we work together on those. Just to follow up, are, have there ever been any efforts to potentially bring the two back together? There's been talk. Yeah. <laughs> There's been talk, but it hasn't gone past that. It would be a cool thing, though. So I have two questions. The first one is, you work with the education department. So I was wondering if you do any work with like the state of Connecticut to ensure that um, when they're learning their Connecticut history, they're also learning Native American Connecticut history as well, and like what has been the process behind that? Because Louisiana's um, not the best on including Native So history. that's something that we're actively working on now. Um, so we've been working with Yukon quite a bit. Um, Yukon has been a really good ally for us. Um, and I did a, a program with a, play, a thing called Upstander Academy and it's teachings on genocidal teachings and how um, we don't really acknowledge that genocide occurred right here in America um, and how to properly teach that to a third grader and a, so on, a, someone in grade school. Um, so that's a cool program that we've, we've worked on. We have a lot of schools that come in and we do teacher previews. So the teachers come in and we teach them the program, we teach them the proper history because a lot of people go through school and learn that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered America. Um, when he discovered the Caribbean, he went the wrong way. He's a documented rapist and led to the death of tons and tons of people. Um, and we learned that the first Thanksgiving was turkeys and hoopla when it was much different than that. Um, the first Thanksgiving was a celebration for massacres um, of native people. And then we don't learn any of that. We learn that everything that we learned in grade school and elementary school is wrong if we take a native studies class in college. Um, we learn a completely different view and we're like, what was my childhood learning about that? Um, and I get that a lot. I get um, people who come in and I go through and they're like, 
I just read a history book last week and it told me this. And I'm like, yeah. Um, so it's something we're working on. Um, we are open to working with um, schools. My school that I went to actually um, opened an elective program where they could learn Pequot history and the local history. Um, we did a program to help against native mascots um, because that was also a big scandal, big thing going on. Um, and within a 50 mile radius of the museum, there's 250 native mascots. Um, so that's something we worked on as well. The state of Maine actually just became the first state to completely eliminate native mascots from their entire state, um, which is pretty cool um, because we're the only race that is used as masketry. And people say it's honoring them, um, which I can, I can see the idea. I mean, I can play devil's advocate and understand, but you can't help what other people do as well. And I went and talked to a school in Massachusetts, um, and they were the Indians. And people get like this strong, strong connection and like will f f go to war with you about their mascot. Um, and I said, what's the name of your women's basketball team? And they said, the Lady Indians. And I said, do you call yourself the Lady Italians or the Lady Irish or anything like that? No, if you're Indian, you can, it reflects to both races, um, both um, sexes. And it's things that we're working on. I mean, we're open at the museum, we're open to help with just about anything education-wise um, to help get that correct, because that's our goal. Um, we've done a bit with the Common Core in Connecticut. Um, it's getting there. It's slow, but it's getting there. And I had one more. Um, I was wondering if your tribal archives does anything um, working within the community and like having the community engage with the archives as well of like inviting them in to you know look at these documents of and just having that discussion on why these archives matter and why they're important and then having to ensure the community has an interest in them as well. So over the past couple of years um, we document everything pretty well. Um, so we have a pretty extensive archives and we're still archiving just about everything we to do today. If there's a family event, um, we make sure everything's archived and put in the system because eventually that, that's history. That's going to be something to, to research and look at. Um, and we have community involvement, um, but not as much as we'd like. Um, and right now, we don't really have anyone over our archives specifically assigned to tending to them, taking care of, of them. And that's the problem. That's what we're suffering with, is having someone who wants to do this, is qualified to do it. Um, and at this point, I think we're willing to, to send a tribal member out to get trained and to do that. We just need to find the person who's willing to do it. Um, I'm looking at your website right now. I, I love the design of your banner uh, for the museum. But I was wondering if you could go back to the aerial of the museum. I'm interested in the design. You might not know yep. specifically, but I, I don't know. Whenever I looked at it, it kind of reminded me of some some local artist drawings of some mounds here. Yep. I was wondering what the design was inspired by. Okay, so the front of the building, this is kind of no one really realizes this, but the front of the building is actually a wampum belt. So wampum is a quahog shell, um, beads made from a sh it's a shell bead, and we put a wampum design in the front. Wampum belts were used to for our ceremonies and protocols. Um, but we also use them to document treaties and agreements with the U.S. government. Um, so we put a wampum belt design on the front of the museum. The dome piece that you see in the back, that's more to represent um, our traditional style dwelling in the Northeast, which is a, a Witu. And you'll see the frame of that there. Um, the person who designed this building designed the exhibits first in his head and then designed the museum around the exhibits, um, which is pretty cool if you look at it. Um, a lot of people when they go in the museum they get confused, um, but it's really simple once you're inside going through. But the main focus was um, portraying of course that, that wampum belt which is really traditional to the east coast and our traditional style dwelling with the Wee Too 
And then the green top terrace right there, that actually goes down and around and you can walk up um, like a ramp. So it's slightly slanted each way and you drop down a little bit more past each one of those lines that you see going across. Um, and this picture also, I'm gonna cut in, this picture is dated back that area right past the tower. Right on that side, that's where the zip line lands now. So there's a big like clear cut through the forest right there where you come down through the zip line. But the main idea was to get through the wampum belt and our traditional style of family dwelling. That's neat, what is the, the tower for? The tower, that's an observation tower. So you go up about 185 feet and you get in this little small glass room and you can see pretty much the entirety of the reservation. It's spooky too because on windy days it shakes. So if it's too windy, we have to close it down, but it's meant to flex. Hi, um, I wanna go back to your pest management. I'm a collections manager at the Hilliard University Art Museum and we have had issues with insects in the past and other than uh, the measures you've already spoken of, um, could you go into more detail about your pest management system? So, Currently, we're without a collections manager, um, so we have a couple people in-house. We have one of our archaeological lab techs who is, her name's Roberta, and she's like the boss. Um, she's like the mom figure, and she makes sure, like, she's on everyone about anything. So we have um, a freezer, of course, if we bring in any... Um, natural items, furs, pelts, anything natural that gets frozen for two weeks um, prior to being brought out. Same with all of our items in our store. When we get anything shipped in, it goes down to our freezer first before we can have it in the building. Um, so it's a little bit hard because when we have our powwows and events, um, everyone's coming in with their feathers and their sh turtle shells and their leather clothing. So we have to compromise a little bit, um, but we're really strict on, on food. We're really strict on, um, you can't bring backpacks or anything down into the exhibits. Um, you can bring your purse, but we're kind of strict on that as well. Um, we just, we try to eliminate as much exposure as we can. Um, we've had, we've lost a couple things. So we had like a chipmunk down there, a, a taxidermy chipmunk, and it was kind of hidden behind a little area. We have like little secret animals that if you really come to the museum and you look around, you'll find a new one every time. And he was bald. Like the, the moths and everything just really took it to him. Um, so we have, we set traps, um, and I mean, we do everything we can to try to keep him out. Um, and it's, it's a constant fight. Um, we have warning systems for employees for food. They're really strict on that as well. Um, like at your desk, you can have water. That's it if you're down below um, the third level. Because our exhibits are on our second and first level. Um, and my office is on the second level and no food, no drinks other than water down there. I wish my staff could hear you speak yeah, of that. They, <laughs> they're really strict about it. She'll, Roberta doesn't play games. <laughs> also, uh, you said that your main exhibit has been up for 21 years. Yep. How have you protected those objects that have been on view for 21 years? No flash photography. Um, we have it, um, the lighting set so that it's perfect and ready for you to take pictures. You don't need flash um, so that it doesn't deteriorate the objects. We have um, a crew that comes in and goes in to make sure the cobwebs aren't there and cleans it well. Um, you can't touch any of the objects there, um, even though once we have a good amount of people in the building, we have to go down there and babysit because we get people who want to go up and wrap their arms around people. We have life cast mannequins. So the mannequins inside this building, they look real. Um, they have tattoos that you can see their veins. They're real life casts of people. Um, and we have people who are curious um, about them and want to lift up their loincloth and stuff like that. And they're all Ken dolls, so there, there's nothing there. Um, they're not exactly. Yeah, so people want to really get into the exhibit, so we have to patrol that quite a bit. Um, 
we've done repairs. Um, we're getting to the point now where everything's 20 years old. So now it's like really trying to take care of it. Um, and so far, so good. So far, so good. Some things we replace, like we have a part and there's a little pond and there's men paddling a canoe and the paddle, one part of the paddle was in the water for that 20 years and the wood just rotted and fell. So replacing things like that. Um, the building's 20 years old now too and we built a system in the museum for rainwater, the gutter system on top, and it goes inside of the building, and that was a, that's a problem. So now when we get rain, we get leaks every now and then, um, and that's things that we're dealing with. But other than that, it's coming along, and that's why we're working on the repairs right now to make sure we're trying to revamp her a bit. Lots of dusting? Lots of dusting. We have a full-time crew. Um, who make sure the exhibits are clean every day, who make sure the, the floors are sparkly, the glass doesn't have fingerprints. Um, so they're on that pretty well. Thank you. Thank you. So I have one question. It sounds like you do a huge amount of work with smaller institutions in New England. Do you have any suggestions for institutions in New England that don't have a resource like your museum and research center and ways they can engage with Native American history? So the crazy thing is a lot of these smaller places in New England, they actually do really well. Um, the local history places, my aunt um, in Narragansett runs a museum called the Tomaquag Museum. It won the President's Award last year. Um, and it's a building, it's literally in a house, um, a small, small space, but they do it well and their programs are well. Um, my best advice is to, to make it interactive, make it so you get to draw the public in. That's the hard part, but if you're able to get something that people want to learn about, something that they're not commonly taught, um, something that makes them think. Um, so that's why when I talk with someone, I'm not afraid to talk about something that might be a little bit controversial because I'm not judgmental on other people's views. I'm perfectly fine. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Um, and debates pique people's interest. Um, I get people who come in and since I hunt, they curse me and want to kick me all over the place um, because I hunt animals. Um, even little schoolgirls, they, they get me the worst. Um, you should hear some of the stuff they say to me. Um, but just with our space, like I said, we've, we've been there for 21 years now, and we have majority of the exhibits are 21 years old. So having something that revolves a bit does help. Um, partnering with other institutions, um, that's one thing that we're looking to do more is partnering with these smaller institutions because we have space. Um, and tapping in with their network and their membership and our membership being able to tap in with them as well. Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of us have the same goal, um, is to maintain and preserve this history and have it taught the correct way. So I guess I've been really concerned about your funding situation and I've been thinking about more things. So uh, before I came here, I was teaching in museum studies and a lot of my uh, students uh, were also concerned with, in general, a lot of museums don't have a lot of funding. Right. And one of the things that they, a couple of different students were writing their theses on membership schemes. And so I was wondering what, um, whether all members of the Mashantucket Pequot tribe already have free membership to the museum, um, and otherwise, is it a paid? Do you, if you're not a member of the tribe, do you then have to pay? And is there then? I wonder if, if a membership scheme for members who aren't part of the, for non-members of the tribe or non-tribal people, would um, would work for you. And a lot of it tends to work with programming, very expensive yep. programming. So right now, tribal members don't pay. Um, it's, it's their museum. Um, it's their history. 
they can come in and out the doors at any time. They don't pay. Um, our membership, um, I believe the base is like 79 bucks. Um, and that gets you and I think a couple other family members for the year, um, exclusive member events. We do um, like cooking classes, things along those lines. We have um, a tribal elder who makes baskets and she holds basket classes for members. They have free entry to um, the exhibits all year. They have a discount on our gift shop and the restaurant. Um, we, we just need to freshen it up a bit. That's, that's the thing. Once we're able to, to offer more for them, we'll definitely get more out of it. Our membership has gone up a little bit the past year, um, which is a good thing. People, the members also get VIP access for the, the feast I was mentioning. Um, so we, just, we definitely need to create more programs and um, make it a little bit more exclusive for them. And I think that will definitely up our membership. We promote it a bit at Foxwoods as well, which that's 20,000 people a day that are walking to the door there. So at least, and that's a market that we need to try to push over to the museum a little bit more. Um, so you mentioned that you have special events like weddings and such. How do you manage that with your very special collections? So <laughs> we have corporate events, we have weddings, we have um, just tons of things because people love the gathering space. The area, that backside of that is just all glass and you can see out at night in the summer, you see all the stars um, in the winter, the snow. Um, so that's another source of income that's why we do it um, because we're able to hire outside catering companies um, foxwoods is right across the way so we use um, bussers and stuff from over there to help clean and set up um, they have all the linen the tables and things like that we have most of that in-house as well um, but we have security at the museum full-time um, tribal police who patrol the area and we make sure we come to agreements with people. So if you're having an event there, um, you just get the space that you're paying for. You don't get to go down to exhibits or collections. We really don't let people into our collections. Um, it has to be a special request. Um, and you either have to go through our tribal historic preservation officer or the director of the museum. Um, collections really at this time aren't open to the public at all. I have two different questions. Um, you mentioned at the beginning you're Smithsonian affiliate, and is there anything other than saying you're a Smithsonian affiliate? No, so you get nothing. That's just it. a name. That's it. Just a name. I kind of figured as much after this whole conversation, but I wanted to check on that. We get free admission there. They get free admission here. Okay. <laughs> um, and then um, on a very different level, um, with your collections and specifically your like archives and your letters and your written documents or even your artifacts um do you allow like if you have a non-tribal member who's doing their phd to come in do they need permission from the council how like how restrictive are you with with researchers who are doing you know so that we kind actually of have a we have a committee a mm -hmm. historical preservation committee and um anything that dissertations, anything like that are written on the tribe. Um, we want to somewhat benefit the tribe as well. Um, um, we want it to be a two-way street. So they will get reviewed um, items that the people want to look at. Um, they, can, they can get access, um, but it does have to get approved by the committee. And then also the tribal historic preservation officer sits on that committee as well. So the approval comes through them. Yeah. So do you have a close relationship with the universities? You kind of mentioned here and there, but I was, it's hard to get a sense of It's that. getting better. Okay. It's definitely getting better. Um, and most of our um, archaeology team that we have in the building now are from Yukon. Okay. Um, and we've, done, we've been connected with them for 30 plus years. 
Um, and our, our relationship's getting better with local universities. Um, Conn College, UConn, we have a program with Mitchell College, which is another local college, URI. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting there. Yeah, because I mean, in some ways, it, it can be a good resource. It also cannot be. I mean, I know at Tulane, we started about 10 years ago, um, the anthropology department with Tunica Bluxy and working with their language and revitalment. And it's been this fan, it's just blossomed into something that the graduate students love yep. because they're teaching it, but then the tribe loves it because yep. they're being taught. So it, it's like everybody's resources got pulled together in a way that's each year gets stronger and stronger. It's something that um, it can't hurt, really. Um, if we're able to, to build a functioning relationship, like right now, I'd say our main ally would have to be UConn. Um, even on a tri not even the museum, but the tribe right now is expanding more into agriculture. Um, we already have been making our own, we tap our own maple trees and make our own maple syrup every year. Um, that's something we've been doing for a while, but we just got two 94 foot long greenhouses. Um, we have our community garden and we are working on being more self-sufficient when it comes to our, our veggies and fruits. Um, and we partnered with UConn on a grant for that. Um, so we're partnering with UConn on an agricultural grant. We're working with their Department of Agriculture and they came and tested our soil and walked us through the whole process, are aligning us with the right people to talk with. And in turn, just last week um, was USET um, United South um, Eastern Tribes. It's a big gathering in D.C. that they have, and we brought UConn with us to present to the USDA on what we're doing there. Um, so its relationships are starting to form and mature more, and it's getting there. I was just wondering uh, what efforts are being made to preserve the Pequot, Pequot language uh, and, and perhaps revitalize uh, into the future? So the cool thing is um, we have some really awesome women in our community. Um, and the Pequot people are a matriarchal society. So historically, um, our women took care of us um, and helped with government issues and helped our tribal elder women decided who the leader of the community was going to be. And um, there's some awesome people who took initiative and we actually have a dictionary now. Um, we have um, classes now that are being taught. They're audio recording everything now. Um, there's, we've created children's books for the younger kids to be able to read in the language. Um, most of our kids now can count to 10. So there's the, the steps are in place now for it to really go. Now we just need to spread it more. Um, so I was wondering how long your review committee has been in place, and then do you have people working, your review committee for the um, research that's been doing, and do you have people who have been looking for, before that review committee was in place, like looking for things that were written of people who were coming into the tribe and not returning that information or that research back? Because um, that's been a major issue. So with us, um you're talking about the historical committee? Yes. So that has been running for, it's been going for a while now. Um, definitely 10 plus years at least. Um, and the cool thing about it is we're required to have a tribal elder um, and our tri tribal historic preservation office um, involved. And then it's headed by one of our tribal council members, so someone from the tribal government. Um, and with that, um, we retain it all because the committee is all tribal members. Um, to be on the committee, you have to be tribal. That's a, so we retain all the information, all the um, talks are recorded, um, and it's all stored in our archives. So retaining it isn't too hard. Non-tribal employees, for the most part, we've been pretty lucky that they are 
eager and willing to share information um, because they are researching our people. Um, like we recently just had someone leave after 30 years and he was the director of our research department and is still open to help us out if need be. Um, and we have all the information in-house. I was also wondering if you guys did any work with UConn or any of the other colleges on organizing your archives or um, just kind of making them more accessible or anything or updating your exhibits. Have y'all thought about partnering with them um, to enlist like graduate students and whatnot to help you out well, We there. have a lot of graduate students that come through the archaeology department mm -hmm. um, and work with them, but not so much in collections and in, with the exhibits. Um, the archaeology department went through and they got um, a battlefield grant and they researched more into the Pequot War and through that we had a newer exhibit open about two years ago, um, but it wasn't too large, but cool artifacts from the Pequot War that haven't been seen before and that was headed by um, graduate students and things along those lines. Um, collections, it's a sensitive subject in the tribe because a lot of people don't want a non-tribal member presiding over the objects um, because we do have some pretty important things in our collections that um, that's why at this point we only allow our tribal historic preservation officer really at this point to go through and make sure everything's maintained. So everything at this point is, we have boxed, we have climate controlled, it's in its drawers, we have the moving shelves so each aisle can move and expand and you can walk down the aisle. It's all numbered and in the computer system. So if you ever want to look at everything, we have everything photographed. You can go right onto our share drive um, if you work at the museum in the department and pull up an object and look at it without actually having to go and put hands on it. We have our nice white gloves so we don't get our oils on the um, objects. Um, but it's still, it's really limited access. Um, you have to be with either I've, I have some access to it. Um, when I worked in the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, I had access, more access to it, but um, it's, it's kind of slim right now. Okay, and one last one. Yep. Um, what kind of computer program do you guys use? Do you use like Past Perfect, or do you use something that's more specific towards indigenous peoples like MOOC2 or something? No, it's just basic. Okay. Yeah, it's, nothing, it's nothing fancy. MOOC2 is super cool, so you should look into it. I'm gonna have to. We need to update a lot. We have time for one final question before we're out of time, if anybody has. So you're rotating exhibits. What are, what's the subject matter of your rotating exhibits, or what would you like them to be? I mean, in the past when we had more funding, we had just about everything come through. We had a cool exhibit. Um, we didn't just focus on Eastern Woodland tribes like the rest of the focus of the museum. We've had exhibits from Western tribes, Western artists who are pretty well known um, put their exhibits in. We've had um, giant bugs in the exhibit space. We've had um, a cool bison exhibit um, for Plains Indian tribes where you went through and you could check out just about everything. Pictures, old pictures of like the mounds of skulls. Um, bison fur and traditional paintings and jewelry made from it. We used to take just about everything. Um, and we tried to keep it with a focus on Native American, but it's at this point we need, we need something interactive. We need something fresh. We need um, anything really. It's We'll take anything, because at this point, I curated the exhibit in the museum this past year that was in our temp space, um, just because there hasn't been one in a couple of years. Um, and that space was just kind of open, and we were using it for events. Um, and to keep membership, you have to have something new for them to look at. Have you, have you ever partner, partnered with the local universities or their university museums and maybe pulled from their collections? We haven't. Um, we have a little bit, other than UConn, which is getting better, we've had a couple problems with a couple universities. Um, and it's stuff that we kind of need to work towards um, with more repatriation things and things that we feel like 
belong to us and they feel like, no, it's ours and in our collections. Um, so we've kind of been headbutting a little bit with that. That's understandable. Thank you. I think we're pretty much at the end of our time now, so thank you all so much for your questions, and uh, please join me in thanking our speaker. <laughs>